All right, I want to share with you. I've been gone for a while, so I've been studying the Word of God in depth. And I was going through the book of Ephesians, and I got to Ephesians 5. And if you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians 5. That's where we're going to be at. And there was one verse that, that God, I mean, he spoke to me. And it was a revelation. God gave me a, a deep word, a deep word. And from that word, there was one question that God put in my mind. There's a question that really began to rattle me. And it's a question that I believe if you ask this one question, one question, it would change everything about you. One question that if you will really begin to ask it and apply it to your life, it will change you and it will change everything about you. It will change the trajectory of your life. That's how big this one, one, one question is. But to get to that question, I got to get some background. So we're going to have a Bible study. So to get to Ephesians 5, we got to go all the way back to Ephesians chapter 1 so you can understand the dynamics before we get to the verse and I give the question. So we're going to do a little background. So Paul is writing to the church of Ephesus. Ephesus is an incredible city. And Paul is writing this letter to them, encouraging them. And he spends the first really three chapters telling them who they are in Christ Jesus. This is our positional truths. This is who we are, not based on what you've done, but what Christ has done for you and in you and through you. This is all about the magnitude, the greatness, the glory, the wonder of Jesus Christ. Paul spends three chapters, y'all. I'm telling you, this is powerful. Just talking about who you are in Christ the moment you receive him by faith. And so I want you to just listen to this. We're going to go quickly. I just want you to hear these truths. He says in Ephesians 1, 3, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every single spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world. Before you were known, he chose you to be holy and blameless in his sight. Why did he do it? In love. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship. He brought you into the family through Jesus Christ, in accordance, not because he had to, but with in accordance with his pleasure and his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one that he loves. In him we have redemption. You see how he's building? In him we have redemption. Through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished upon us. Now skip down to verse 11. In him we were also chosen. I love that God chooses me. Before you ever chose God, he chose you. I don't care what people have said about you. I don't care what people have proclaimed about you. I don't care what people have spoken over you. The living God that matters above anything else says, I want you. He chose you and has been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ, we might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal. What type of seal did he mark you with? He didn't just put a little mark on you and say, you're mine. No, he gave you the promise of the Holy Spirit. So God says, I'm going to accomplish what I'm going to accomplish because I'm going to put my spirit within you. You receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit when you receive Jesus Christ. And so he says, you've been marked by the promise of the Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. God says, I'm not going to give up on you, even if you give up on me. I've given you my spirit. My spirit is going to work in you to transform you to be the people that I've called you to be. So now skip to Ephesians 2, verse 4. Why would he do this? But because of his great love for us. No, notice not your love for him, but your, his love for you. His great love for us. God, who is so rich in mercy, he made us alive. With Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions, why would he do this? Pastor John Sellers preached an amazing message. If you haven't listened to it, you need to go back two weeks ago, listen to this. All about grace, he talks about. He says, he did all of this, all of this. We were dead in our transgression. It is by grace you have been saved. You've been saved through grace. Then verse six. So in God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Now he says, right now you're seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. What does that mean? That means because of Christ's authority, you begin to complete authority and power to live in the fullness of all God has for you. Right now you're seated in a position of authority. We say, I don't feel like it. I, I know, but this is the position. This is what Christ did for you. This is who you are. For you're seated with him in the heavenly realms in Christ in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Well, why would he do this? For it is by grace you have been saved. 
Through what? Through what? Come on, I haven't been gone that long. Del Tony, you better shout it. Through what? Faith. And this is not from yourselves. Praise God, it's not from yourselves. You know why? If it was about you, you would mess it up. God says, I'll take care of it. You just have to trust me. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one could ever boast. No one can ever say, I did enough to be saved. God says, no, you didn't. I did all the work. And so now skip to Ephesians 3, verse 16. I told you, I'm going to give you some background. So he says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power. How? Together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And to not only just experience this, but to know this love that surpasses knowledge. So why, Paul, that you may be filled, filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, now, do you see over and over what he's talking about? You and I are not a part of the equation. That's really good. He's saying, I love you. I care for you. I'm going to do all the work. You just need to receive it by what? Faith. That's the heartbeat of the gospel. These are positional truths of what God has done for us. And so he says, I want you to know who you are in Christ, what Christ did, what Christ did. Now he's going to shift. He spent those first three chapters talking about who you are in Christ. Now he's going to talk about, now here's how you live because of that. So once I know who I am in Christ, now I know how to live in Christ. And so he gets to Ephesians 5, verse 8. And here's what he says. For you were once darkness. Now it's interesting, right? He doesn't say you were once in darkness. He says, no, you were just darkness. That's who you were. Darkness meaning you were separated from God. There was nothing good within you on God's end. There was nothing within you that God says, okay, yeah, I, I, I need you. You're good enough for me. No, the, the scripture is very, very clear. You and I were once darkness. That's who we were. It's our identity, our position. But, and that's a big but. That's a big but. We like big butts, Right? Maybe you're not there yet. Maybe it's been too far. All right. We like, we like these buts because now there's a shift in thinking. So he's going to go, okay, here's who you once were. You were darkness, but you are now, you are light. How? In the Lord. Come on, you got to track with me. He says, you were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Before Christ, you were not just in darkness, you were darkness. But now because of your faith in Christ Jesus, you are now light. Before you were completely separated, dead, darkness. Scripture is very clear about who we are. This is why it says in Colossians 1.13, Paul writes, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. Now the word dominion means owned by. It, it, it means you are controlled by. So before Christ, we were controlled by and consumed by darkness and deceit and brokenness and sin. And now we've been brought into his kingdom. Now a new kingdom, a new ownership. There's now a new owner of my life. And the ownership is of the son that he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now, the reason I got to unpack this is because there is no middle ground. You are either in darkness or light. You either are dead or you are alive. You, you notice what scripture doesn't say. It doesn't talk about you're good or bad. That's behavior. It talks about position. I can be good and still live in darkness because I'm darkness. You can meet nice people who are still dead. This is why, this is why Christianity and the gospel isn't about the power of making you a better person. It's the power to position you to go from life or go from death to life, from darkness to light. That's the power. So you are either, and this is, this is, this is hard for us to understand in our current mindset. You are either owned by the devil, the sinful flesh, or the darkness of the world. Or you're owned by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. You can't be owned by both. 
So you can be really nice and still be owned by darkness. It's about faith in Christ Jesus. And the moment you receive Christ, there's a shift that happens in you and through you that the scripture talks about being born again. You become alive. You, you step from this darkness into the power of the light that comes through Christ Jesus. And sometimes I think we get this mixed up. And, and, and so many times, re really, the understanding of our faith gets shifted when we think that Christianity is just about moral behavior. It's not about doing good or being better. Either you're owned by the demonic powers or you are owned by the love and the grace of Christ Jesus. He says, I, I just want to draw the lines here because if you get this next up, you won't know how to do the next part. So he says, Ephesians 5, 8, look what he says now. For you were once darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. And so now here's the application. So live as children of light. So live as people who are loved, live as people who are redeemed, live as people who are forgiven, live as people who are owned by grace through faith in Christ Jesus, live by people who, because he owns you, you're going to live to give him glory because he's worthy of it. Live for him, he says, live as the children of the light, live to honor him, live as redeemed. Well, how can you live as children of light? He says, verse nine, for the fruit of the light. Now, now fruit means not works. But fruit is what the Spirit of God, the power of God's going to work within you. It says, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. That means the moment you come to know Jesus Christ and you place your faith in him, you say, Jesus, forgive me my sins. Come into my life. Thank you that you died on the cross for me. Thank you that you rose again for me. I give you my life. The, the moment you do that, you now have the power within you to live in all goodness. Apart from this, you were darkness, but now I can live in all goodness. I can live in all righteousness. I can live in all truth. Before, I could not. But now I'm empowered through the power of the Holy Spirit that's within me. Now I'm empowered to live this out every single day of my life. There is nothing that is holding you back as soon as you become a believer in Jesus Christ because the power of the resurrection now lives within you and you have the power to live in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. You don't have to stay in brokenness, addiction, depression, fear. You don't have to live enslaved in that anymore. You've been brought into a new kingdom with a new king. And so, how do I live that? This is the verse. And when the Holy Spirit, I read it, he leaped off the page. So Paul says, here's how you live this. Find out what pleases the Lord. You are now transitioned from darkness to light. Now live as light. Well, how, Paul? Every day, every second, every moment of your life. Find out, discover, investigate, put some effort into it. You have a responsibility to find out what pleases the Lord. Everything you do, he says, here's, here's, our, here's our role now of life. Here's what we're called to do. Find out what pleases the Lord in everything you do. Instead of taking you out of the world, he says, I'm going to keep you here in the world, but I've transferred you to the kingdom of light, but I'm going to allow you to continue to be in the brokenness of the world. And so as you live in the brokenness of the world, but yet you are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, here's what I want you to do. I want you to live your life finding out what pleases me every single second of your day. This becomes the grid. This becomes the foundation of every single thing that we do. This is what shifts us from, from some static knowledge of God. This is what shifts us from merely just knowing about God and it allows, allows us to begin to have this dynamic relationship to know the living God. And so I said, God, how do I do this? And here's the question God just pressed upon me, the question that changes everything. Here's the one question you have to ask. Lord, how can I please you? This is the question. Lord, how can I please you? 
God, as I head to work, I, I don't want to go to work because I don't like work and they don't pay me enough and I got to sit next to Bobo and man, I just don't like them. And God, I, I'm, I'm mad. Okay, but what if, what, if, what if instead of you just complained all the time, what if you stopped and just paused and said, okay, God, hold on, God. Lord, how can I please you at work today? As you're raising your kids and you want to send them off for adoption. Because <laughs> killing them will put you in jail. God, I'm struggling here. How can I please you? Raising my kids. As I deal with conflict, God, as I deal with conflict, God, how can I please you in conflict? God, as I, as, as I watch Fox News, or God, as I watch CNN, God, how can I please you? God, as I'm single and I don't want to be single anymore. And, I, and you know, God, I'm swiping right and swiping left and I keep swiping, but I'm still single. God, maybe I haven't asked you the question, God, how can I please you in my singleness? God, how can I please you in my marriage? God, how can I please you with my finances? How can I please you with my education? God, how can I please you? This becomes, this becomes the grid that you begin to make every decision out of. This is what makes you out of this static knowledge and allows you to walk in the fullness of what God has for you. So many times the reason you're not experiencing the fullness of all God has for you in your life is because you've never really asked this question. See, this question changes everything. In fact, it's such an important question. We're going to spend two weeks on it, two weeks on it. We're going to spend this week asking the question, well, why is this so important? Why, why, why? Shout why. Some of you are why people. You never got over it since you were the age of two. You just get why, 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 why? We're going to go over the why this week. And next week, though, some of you are practical people. How many practical people are in the house? I love you. You're, 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 that's what I am. I'm practical. Next week, we're going to talk about how. This week, why? Next week, how? We're going to talk about how do we apply this out, and we're going to study the life of Abraham. You don't want to miss next week. You don't want to miss next week. And so this week, why? Why? Why is this so important? Paul gives us really three insights into the, why this question, question is so crucial. Why this question changes everything. I want to make sure you take some notes because I believe if you will start asking this question and actually doing it, it will change everything about you. I believe that. This is really the essence of life. This is why God gave you breath. This is the reason. In every single situation, in every single day of everything that you're going through, this is the foundation of us who call ourselves followers of Christ. Those who live as children of who are loved by God, redeemed by God, forgiven by God, chosen by God, adopted by God, predestined by God, adopted into the family of God. This is how we are to live. God, how can I please you right now, right here in this situation? And if you would just ask, I'm telling you, this question you could ask wherever you're at. Stuck in I-4, ask him. <laughs> ask him, no matter where you're at. He's going to speak. And when you ask it, here's why this is so important. First, write this down. It cultivates a deeper relationship. It ultimately begins to cultivate a deep, 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 deep relationship. You know what the heart of God is? The heart of God is he wants you to know him and he wants to know you. This is why the number one commandment of the Bible is not obey God. The number one commandment of the Bible is to love God. See, God wants, God wants you to love him because he loves you. He loves you. I, I don't know why you came to church today, but I know there's one thing that God wants you to hear above anything else. He loves you. He's radically crazy, loves you with a radical love to the point he's willing to die for you. He loves you. And what he wants in return is not for you to check something off a box or become religious. He wants you to have this dynamic relationship with him. And what cultivates the dynamic part of the relationship is when you ask this question. Okay, God, how can I please you right now? Because if you love somebody, you want to please them, right? This week, this past week was my wife's birthday. Happy birthday, Shana. So several years ago, when we first started dating, she said, I, I said, we were getting to date each other. I said, who's your favorite, who's your favorite musician? And she said, I thought she was going to say, you know, uh, Backstreet Boys, NSYNC, Pearl Jam, Guns N' Roses. Some of the, I, I thought, you know, who, who knows, Garth Brooks, 
I don't, I don't want, I don't want to miss anybody out here. I don't Elton John. I don't want to miss anybody. I can go on and on. But I said, who's your favorite? She said, Bob Seeger. I said, Bob, who? She said, Bob, Bob Seeger. I said, I, I've never, I've never really heard of this Bob Seeger. And then she said, well, let me play you something. So she played, I was like, oh, I know that song. And then she played another. I said, oh, I know that song. Then she's like, like a rock. I thought like, I know that song too. And, and, and so we started listening. I started listening to Bob Seeger. Not because I love Bob Seeger. I listened to Bob Seeger because I wanted this girl. So you know what we did? You know what we did this week? We paid money to actually not go see Bob Seeger, but someone who imitates Bob Seeger. You know why I did it? Because I still love this woman, and I, 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 what pleases her pleases me, and I keep asking that question. I keep asking that question. Because that's what love does, doesn't it? Love says, how can I please you? Because that's what begins to cultivate the intimacy of this relationship. And that really is the essence of faith. Look what the writer of Hebrews says, Hebrews 11. He says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So what does God want you to do throughout your life? Have what? Faith. Never forget that. Because anyone who comes to him, that means to seeks to know him, must believe that he exists. But, but here's what's incredible. Many of you stop and you put the period there. So what faith is, is someone just goes and says, yeah, I believe in God. And Paul says, no, no, no. The writer of Hebrews says, no, that, that's not faith. Here's the rest of faith. You don't just believe that he exists, but that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. You see, the essence of faith is that I earnestly seek God. Do you know how you really know you're a believer in Christ? That there's a deep desire within you to please God. If that desire is not within you, you need to go before God and say, God, I want it. That's really the testimony of your, if you're a believer, the spirit will testify to your spirit and will shout sonship daughtership over you and say, this is the one I love. And it will become alive within you. And there's going to be a desire within you to follow and to pursue hard after Christ. Because you know that he rewards those who seek him. Well, what's the reward? The greatest reward God can give you. You know what the greatest reward God can give you? A relationship himself. The verse that changed my life, one of the verses, Psalm 1611. It says, God, you make known to me, you make known to me the path of life. God, when I seek you, I find life. And in your presence, there's fullness of joy. You notice where fullness of joy is? It's not in what you get from God, but it's in God himself. God, you're my joy. There's nothing else I want more than you. God, there's nothing else. Because God, if I had the whole world, it still wouldn't be big enough to satisfy the longing within me for joy and peace and hope. That's only found in you, God. So you make known to me the path of life and in your presence is fullness of joy. And at your right hands are pleasures forevermore. God, thank you, God. It's not just about knowing you or living better. It's about being with you. God, you are the one that I seek. You're the one that I'm after. Reveals the dynamic aspect of the faith. So that's why when you pray this question, God, Lord, help me, help me, help me. God, how can I please you in this moment? It means you have to begin to listen to what actually God is calling you to do. Proverbs 8, 34 says it this way. Blessed are those who listen. You spend a lot of time talking, but when's the last time you just listen? God, how can I please you in this moment? Then you listen. You see, we, we believe that God is a person, which means he actually communicates to us. He's going to speak to you in the stillness of your life, of your heart. He's going to speak to you through his word. So God, blessed are those who listen to me, who watch daily at my doors. Catch, catch this, daily. Waiting at my doorway. God, I'm, I'm, I'm longing. Where you move, I want to move. Where you go, I want to go. This is pursuit. For those who find me, find life. And they receive favor from the Lord. Favor. God, I'm asking, I'm listening, I'm seeking, because not only am I just asking, this, has, this, has, this doesn't matter in your life if you say, Lord, how can I please you? And he tells you, and you do nothing. 
Lord, how can I please you? And then you listen and then you begin to pursue it and say, okay, God, I'm going to do it. There's no cost. There's no cost. I remember what changed my life, what radically shifted my life is when I got to the point, I fell on my face and I said, God, I don't care the cost. I just want you. I'll do whatever you say. I'll go wherever you want to go. I'll give up everything I have because God, what I have found is there's nothing greater to my heart, to my life than you. And God says, now I'm ready to bless you. Now I'm ready. So that question changes you. It changes the dynamic of your relationship with God. If you feel distant from God, it's because you stopped asking this question. If you feel like, hey, something's missing in my relationship with the living God, it's because you've stopped asking this question. This question is powerful because it, 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 it begins to bridge the gap and bring you into this intimacy. Number two, when you pray, Lord, how can I please you? Number two, here's why it's so important. Because it reveals God's purposes for your life. When you pray that and you listen, you begin to be open and become aware of how God wants to move through you and how God wants you to partner with him. How God wants actually for you to participate in his redemptive work. Do you realize that God has placed a calling upon your life? That what you are incredibly unique to God and he's purposely put a calling upon you that no one else on planet earth can do. And the reason, the way that you can begin to discover your purpose is you find out what pleases God. Because by finding out what pleases God and actually doing it is what allows you to begin to walk in your purposes. Look what he says. Keep going. Ephesians 5 verse 15. He's going to keep unpacking this. Here's what it means to ask this question and live his children to light. He says, be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. The word careful, if you have your Bible, circle it. The word careful means I'm going to be intentional and I'm going to be I'm going to intently look at my life and I'm going to ask that question every single day, every single moment. God, how can I please you in this moment? Now, why is this so important? He's going to give us an application. Verse 16. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. See, when I pray that, it begins to open my life up to see things I've missed before. Praying that opens my life, then now I can leverage the time that I have now and leverage it for the sake of fulfilling the purposes that God has for me. So many of you miss out on opportunities, not because God is against you, but because you're unaware. So many times we miss out on the blessings, not because God is not willing, but because we're unaware where God is leading. This is why this is so crucial for you and I in the moment to ask this every single day. God, What is pleasing to you? What can I do to please you? And God will show you because he's trying to get you to do the very thing he's called you to do. This is how you discover life. This is how you go through life and you don't just kind of rub your wheels and kind of spin out and move nowhere. This is what gives you breath. This is what allows you to rise up and breathe purpose in your life. This is what allows you to understand I've been anointed by the living God to do something no one else is called to do because he's placed a calling on my life. That's why I get out of bed every morning, even if I'm depressed, even if I'm overwhelmed, even if I'm not feeling like it, because I believe that God has a purpose for me that no one else in life can do. And so God, how can I please you this day, this moment, this season, this place? Because God, I know you're working all around me. I just want to join in on the good times that you're having. You're the answer to the solution so many times in life. You've been anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, therefore, do not be foolish. Don't waste your time. But understand what the Lord's will is. What's the Lord's will? For you to live out, find out what pleases him. This is your responsibility. This is what God says. You want to know what I want you to do? So many times people, well, I don't know what God wants me to do. I don't know what God wants me to do. I don't know what God wants me to do. Well, if you ask God what pleases you, he'll tell you what to do. He's not holding back from you. He wants you to understand what his will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will for your life. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's handiwork. You, literally, the word is poemea. It means that God wrote a poem about you. It, it means that when, when on his refrigerator, you know, my kids are small. They would write all these, these little love notes to me and these drawings I put on my fridge. God says, on my fridge, I have this drawing of you because I love you. I've handcrafted you. I know your mama wanted to abort you, 
but there's a reason you weren't aborted. My hand is upon you. You see, you're God's handiwork. You were created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. That means there's certain works that you can do that no one else can do. Our world is desperate for solutions. Everybody's pointing out the problem. God's looking for people to rise up and say, I'm a part of the solution. God, how can I please you by doing whatever you want me to do to be the solution to the problems of the world around me? You've been anointed. You've been anointed. You've been anointed. You have a purpose. Push somebody say, you have a purpose. Come on, say it like you mean it. The land, you better be shouting it. Push three people. Say, you have a purpose. 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 Going through your day unintentional, unaware, is wasting your life. Stop wasting your life. The most valuable commodity you have is not your money, it's your time. So use your time wisely, Paul says. Just keep asking the question. And it's incredible. When you ask it, you become aware of things you missed, you missed, you missed. I can't, so many times I enter into a store, and if all I'm doing is trying to please me, I'm going to miss out on all the opportunities, right? I enter into Walmart or Target or wherever you want to go. In my mind, if I'm not careful, my mind can get so consumed on, hey, I got to get going. I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. In that moment, I miss out on, hold on, God, there's a reason I'm here. And it's not just to buy some more Diet Mountain Dew and coffee so I don't (laughs) struggle in the morning. God, no, (laughs) there's something you have for me. It's incredible when you ask that question, how you begin to see things you missed. The problems and the situations have been all around you, but you missed it because you haven't been aware of it. So when I was on on vacation, there was this dude trying to, he made a stupid decision. He tried to drive his truck to launch his boat in the ocean on the ocean. (laughs) And everybody's surrounding him and they start Here's where we are. Here's, here is the definition of our society today. Instead of helping the guy, you know what they did? They pulled out their phones and started videoing the guy. They were like, this is going to be a viral moment. A guy's trucks are going to get lost to the ocean here. And, and they're filming it. And I'm sitting there, and I keep praying that, God, how can I please you? And God says, go over to help the guy. And I'm like, he doesn't want to be helped. He's stupid. <laughs> and God says, go help him. And I said, he don't want to be helped, God. I mean, you know, this is a, this a, this a, I mean, he's beefed up, has tattoos all over him. I'm like, he's, he's, I don't, he surely knows what he's doing because I wouldn't do that, but he knows something I don't know. And God says, no, go. I went over, ended up helping him. He looked at me and said, why would you do it? I said, because God told me. And his face just went. And he says, all I can say is thank you. But see, what I would have missed And what do you miss if you don't engage in the very thing God is calling you to engage in? All it takes is a question. Lord, how can I please you in this moment? Try it. Walk into work. Pray it. Walk into school. Pray it. Walk into situation. Pray it. God will tell you. That's where you find your purpose. And then finally, when you ask that question, Lord, how can I please you? It creates space for the Holy Spirit to fill you. The scripture says that the spirit of God has been given to you to empower you and to allow you to experience the very thing that God has for you. The spirit has been given to you so that you can live in the fullness of all that Christ has. The spirit takes the truth of God and makes it experience your reality to you. You can't live the Christian life without the power of the Holy Spirit. It's impossible. That's why Jesus gave you the spirit. And as soon as you receive Christ, you receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. You don't receive part of the Holy Spirit or 25% of the Holy Spirit. You receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is actually a person, the third person of the Trinity. And that's why it's interesting that Paul, in the same passage, he's talking about, okay, every time, everything you go, find out what pleases the Lord. He makes this statement in verse 18. Look what he says, Ephesians 5, 18. Do not get drunk on wine. Well, why? Because that leads to debauchery. He says, stop living for yourself. I mean, why do you get drunk with wine? Why do you get drunk with wine? I know you've never done this, but just say hypothetically, you wanted to get drunk one day. 
The reason you're tempted to get drunk is either two reasons. One, you want to please yourself, or two, you want to please yourself by running from the problem you're trying to face. You're living to please who at that moment? Yourself. So Paul says, don't keep living to please yourself because that leads to debauchery. Debauchery means destruction, ruin. You're, gonna, you're never experiencing the joy and the fullness of all God has for you. You'll never experience his peace, his goodness, his hope. You'll never experience his favor when you keep living for you. It's impossible. So he says, so how are we supposed to live, Paul? He says, instead, be filled with the Spirit. The word filled is a present active imperative, which means it's not a suggestion. Present active means it's a constant thing that I have to do constantly. How do you get drunk with wine? Now, again, hypothetically, I'm just speaking. Do you have to take one sip? What do you have to do? If you really wanted to get, I mean, slobber faced out of it, I like no cares in the world, what would you do? You wouldn't even pick up a glass. You'd pick up the what? You pick up the body, you would chug it. You would keep going over and over. You keep drinking it and drinking it and drinking it and drinking it until you were drunk. How do you filled with the Holy Spirit? Lord, how can I please you? I'm not just saying it once, but I'm coming before him and I'm asking over and over again because in that moment it's creating space. You see, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I have the fullness of the Holy Spirit within me. But what I'm doing in that moment is I'm allowing the Holy Spirit to breathe life, joy, freedom, healing, hope, power in my life. When I go before the Lord and I say, Lord, how can I please you? I begin to open up the doors of my life and the windows of my life and allow the fresh wind of the Holy Spirit to fill me. So many of you are living in brokenness because you haven't created space for the Holy Spirit to fill you because you keep living for you and living for you is getting you nowhere. Living for you is ending up in ruin, debauchery. And when you refuse to do this, There's a danger. Flip back one chapter. Ephesians 4, 27. Paul says, if you don't do this, here's what happens. If you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, here's what you begin to do. Do not give the devil a foothold. You see, if if I don't ask in whatever area of my life where I don't say, Holy Spirit, how can I please you? God, Lord, show me, how can I please you in this area? When you stop opening that window, what you actually do is you shut the window out on the movement of the Holy Spirit and you begin to open the window for demonic activity in your life. You begin to open up a window for darkness to enter in where there should be light. You begin to open up a door where a thief can enter in the steal, kill, and destroy. Many of you are living in brokenness and you're living in defeated lifestyles because you're afraid to open the window and say, God, whatever I want, whatever you want, I will do. How can I please you? And you keep, you're scared to do that because the evil one has duped you to believe that if you pray that you'll be miserable. And so you shut the door on that. And what you're doing is you're opening the door for activities to enter into your life to influence you for destruction. Now, God can own the house, but you can let squatters in. You can let people into the house to destroy the good things that God wants to do in there. And so many of you keep leaving the window of opportunity open for the evil one to come in and still kill and destroy because you're so afraid to say, Lord, how can I please you? And then begin to live for it. And the darkness is intruding upon your life. And God placed me to look over you and say, hey, listen, it's time for freedom. If you want to live in freedom, then let's act in freedom and let's close the door to the devil and say, God, however you want, whatever you want, I will please you because I want your joy. I want your hope. I want your peace. I want your freedom. I want your love. I want your power. And there's nothing 
nothing else that I want more than you. And God, I'm opening up every door of my house. There's not an area of my life, my finances, my relationship, my sexual life, my mind life, who I date, who I don't date, how I'm married, how I raise my kids. God, there's nothing off limits because I know that if I don't give you access to this area, I'm ultimately giving access to the one who wants to still kill and destroy. And I'm tired of ending up in brokenness. I'm ready to rise up in the anointing that is mine in Christ Jesus and live in the freedom that is mine in Christ. So I'm curious, what door are you opening right now? Who are you allowing in? I can't make that decision for you. You do. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Lord, how can I please you? Sir, now join me in praying with me. All of our locations, the land, Deltona, or City Journey Church anywhere, no matter where you're at. Just open up your hands before the Lord, just right now. Open them up. And just say, Lord, Lord, how can I please you? Maybe for some of you, the first step is you've never really received Jesus Christ. So right now, just with hands lifted, will you say, God, I turn away from my sinful self and I trust in you as Savior and Lord. Jesus, forgive me. Come into my life. I need you. Me leading me has not gotten me to good places. And so, Jesus, I need you. And scripture says those who call upon the Lord, he will save. Every single person, it doesn't matter what you've done, it's what Christ has done. And then for every believer with just these hands open, I believe this is the divine moment. I believe that right now, God's about to bless you. I believe God's about to pour out his favor upon you. I believe that God's about to heal you. I believe that God is about to open up opportunities you never thought possible because you're turning from pleasing yourself and you're asking the question, God, how can I please you? God, how can I please you? And just right now, whatever you're facing, the most difficult situation, no matter what you're going through, will you just say, God, how can I please you right now in this? Just say, God, I'm going to make this commitment. I'm not asking you to do this for a year. I'm not even going to ask you to do it for a month. You, you won't be able to do that. What I'm asking you, will you just do it for the next seven days? That's all. The next seven days, will you just, before you put your feet on the ground, will you just, before you roll out of bed, will you just say, Lord, how can I please you? Holy Spirit, fall with power. Fill your people by the authority of Christ Jesus. Rain down, open up the heavens, rip open the heavens and visit us, God. In this moment, I pray you would bless and prosper every single man and woman that comes and opens their hands and says, God, how can I please you? God, I believe you're about to set some people free through this. I believe you're about to show your purpose through this. I believe you're about to stir up hearts where they were hard. You're about to create something that is missing for a long time. Holy Spirit, would you fall with a freshness? We give you room and I bind you, evil one, from intruding into every area. I bind you from squatting in houses that are owned by the bud blot, bud, blood bought power of Jesus Christ. And I pray your Holy Spirit would fill them every area, every area of their life. Not Don't let there be an area of their life, an area of their thoughts, their mind, their seasons, where they're not giving this over to you. Spirit, show them the goodness of the Lord. Because not only do we believe that you exist, we believe that you reward those who faithfully seek you. For you want to flourish upon us. Every spiritual blessing is ours in Christ Jesus. Every promise is amen and amen in Christ Jesus. We walk in the fullness of the authority of Christ and we grab a hold of the mantle of responsibility and we live our lives not to please ourselves but we live our lives to say God I live to please you Lord how can I please you and just tell him whatever you say God I will do it because I love you it's in the name of Jesus we pray and give him a shout of praise